This is Mike Rennick. I'm a broker associate with Keller Williams on the Water. I am the senior broker and the team lead for Team Rennick Real Estate Services. I hope everyone's having a good day. Let's start off. What I like to do now is with the weather forecast. It's currently, um, let me refresh this for a second. It is currently 69 degrees. And it actually it just jumped at 75 degrees and we're going to an 85 degree high with sun. So this is a beautiful time of the year down here in Florida. So I appreciate the fact that uh, we can do these kind of things. What we're talking about today and as we go forward, we're really breaking down the buying process and the selling process. Both of them can be extremely complex, even with experienced agents involved. So what I want to do is at each sub process is bringing in an expert. And that's what we have today. What I'd like to do is introduce um, Mr. Hankin as we talk about the property inspections. There's Mike, and let me uh, go through his bio. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Mike. So here we have um, Mr. Hankin, and some of you who have been on earlier episodes have heard this, but he's an attorney with the law firm of Hankin and Hankin. It's a dual law firm with him and Sheehan, and still trying to figure out which Hankin is first. But Mr. Hankin, Practices primarily in the areas of residential and commercial real estate transactions. He's an approved agent for the Chicago Title Insurance Company, the Attorney's Title Insurance Fund, and Old Republic Title Insurance Company, and has been designated as a board-certified real estate attorney. That's the highest level of recognition by the Florida Bar. He regularly represents buyers, sellers, and lenders in all aspects of real property transactions. Mr. Hankin grew up in Sarasota attended Riverside High School, and then went to uh, went on to Emory University, where he received his Bachelor's of Business Administration in Wake Forest, is where he obtained his Juris Doctorate degree. So good morning, Mike. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me on again. So if I can just hit a couple of buttons here. Remember, on, on this as we, we explore the technology, we're one button away from me making a huge mistake and wiping this out. So I'm going to try to keep my hands and fingers um, off the keyboard here. But uh, what we want to talk about today, and it's a very, very important topic called property inspections. And I'm asked that question as a broker all the time by my buyers, should I have a property inspected? And my answer always is yes. And from a seller perspective, my sellers ask me, what must I do to get ready for property inspections? So I just want to have an, an open-ended conversation. And Michael, I'll let you kick us off. So thank you again. Sure. Uh, well, again, thank you so much for having me. Inspections, in my experience, are the number one issue that creates further issues for us in real estate closings. Um, and it's a complicated issue. One, you have the various intricacies of the building code and uh, what's working condition, what's not working condition. But you also have two different types of contracts that have drastically different inspection provisions. Um, so if you were on an earlier episode, you might have heard me talk about the different forms of contract. Um, and this is one of the areas where making that decision to use the as-is contract really provides some benefits during the inspection phase. So if you use the as-is contract, the inspection phase gets pretty simplified. You have, by default, a 15-day inspection period in that contract. You do whatever inspections you want within your 15-day period, and then you either cancel the contract, don't cancel the contract, or try to negotiate something with the seller for anything that you found during your inspection period. Uh, so I don't want to belabor that too much since I covered it in an earlier video, but if you use the right form of contract going into your inspection period, things get much simpler. Now, let's say you didn't use that as is form of contract. You didn't hire Mike as your realtor and he didn't steer you to use the right contract. It happens sometimes, too often, I know, but sometimes. Uh, the other form of contract is uh, what I call the repair limit contract. In this contract, it has kind of a convoluted back and forth structure. So under that contract, there's a 15 day by default inspection period. And within that 15 days, the buyer or buyer's agent has to notify the seller 
of those items which don't meet the repair standards. Um, repair standards here would be the uh, general, it has to be in working condition. Um, so let's say you do an inspection and you find out that, oh, let's see, there's um, some water damage on the ceiling. And you look up and you say, I don't know what caused that water damage. The working condition would only require the seller to fix whatever's causing the water damage, not necessarily the cosmetic um, symptoms of that damage. Uh, so first of all, buyer does their inspection within 15 days, tells the seller, these are the things that aren't in working condition. The seller then has to go out and within 10 days after getting that notice from the buyer has to go out and have their own inspections, their own um, repairs and estimates, uh, their own estimates of the repairs done. Once that's done, you look at that number and you say, is that above the amount the seller's obligated to repair under the contract or under the amount the seller's obligated to repair in the contract? If it's under the amount, the seller's obligated to fix whatever the item is. If it's over the amount, the seller then gets to say, hey, I'll fix the extra, or no, I won't fix the extra. If the seller says, no, I won't fix the extra, then the buyer would have the right to cancel. If the seller doesn't say anything, and this is kind of interesting, then either party has the right to cancel, which people don't usually think of. Now, I mentioned something there quickly, which some of the viewers may have said, what the heck is this amount that the seller is obligated to repair? Um, in that repair limit contract, there's an amount which a seller is obligated to repair. The default in the contract is 1.5% of the purchase price, uh, but as most things in the contract, it is negotiable. Uh, so I'm sorry I gave you a lot of information right there. I'm sure there's questions. So let me back up and see if I can clarify any of that information for you a little further. So I, I think that's, I mean, Mike, that's great information. Let's go back um, to the beginning of the process. So a buyer is, is putting an offer in on a, a property here in, in Florida. Florida law, and correct me, this is a statement, but it's really a question. Florida law requires the agent and the homeowner to disclose any known problems with the property. Is that true? Yes, a seller and their agent has to disclose anything which materially affects the value of the property and it's not readily observable. So a couple okay. of adjectives in there. If go, go there's ahead. an obvious roof leak and you look up and hey, you can see sky when you're standing in the living room, a seller technically doesn't need to disclose that because it's obvious. So your buyers should look for obvious things because they can't sue or go back after a seller for things that they could have seen with their own eyes while looking through. Um, so yes. Okay. So let's say we have a very honest seller and a very honest agent, and there's things with the home that the seller doesn't know about. In in my mind, that's what the cost for the inspector is worth, is uncovering things that nobody has seen so far. Does that make sense, Mike? It does, yes. And it uh, also, to a certain extent, keeps the seller honest. So if there is something that maybe your buyer wouldn't see, even though the seller knew about it, if they don't tell you, you have the inspector to hopefully find that. So let, let me throw a high hardball at you. It's baseball season. My, my baseball team in Michigan is not doing too well right now. Um, but let me throw this question because we face it all the time. So we have a buyer and we've got a contract. And during inspection, we find out that the AC unit is 12 years old. Um, the AC is functioning properly, but 12 years is probably getting closer to end of life. So, of course, the buyer respectfully wants that addressed because he wasn't aware that it was 12 years. And the seller's saying, well, gee, it's working fine. Um, where does that leave us at that point, Mike? This is a, a great question and really helps to illustrate why I prefer that as his contract. Under the repair limit contract, the seller gets to say, the AC is in working condition. I'm not obligated to fix it. And the buyer stuck with that AC, even though it may have a year or two years worth of usable life and they may wind up having a large expense soon. It's 
something they may have not known about when entering into the contract, but they have no recourse under the repair limit contract. Under the as-is contract, full unqualified right to terminate within that 15-day inspection period. And so you, the buyer would have the ability to go back to the seller and say, I want a new AC, and if you say no, I can always cancel the contract. So it gives a lot more negotiating power and uh, ability to the buyer. So let me let me counter with this because it happens to me all the time, um, and we preface it before we we go in, so we we nip it in the bud. But so I'm representing a buyer, and I go in and I ask for that new AC unit based on my buyer's direction, and the seller's agent reminds me. They'll say, Mike, you submitted an as-is contract. As-is means as-is. Is is that really true? Um, So, yes, that's sometimes you do get that response from a seller. In my mind, my response to that is we submitted the contract or the buyer submitted the contract based upon the information they knew at the time. Um, And now that there's additional information, there's a new negotiation. Both parties now know what it is that's being bought and sold. And at that point, I think it's appropriate for the two to come back to the table. Um, so I do agree with those sellers. If a buyer comes back and objects to something that they knew about ahead of time. So if a buyer wants new carpet after the inspection period, I don't really feel like that's using your inspection period in good faith, legally permissible, maybe not morally Right. Um, But for things that you didn't know about, uh, potential plumbing leaks, structural issues, things that a common buyer wouldn't see, um, that's really what the as is is there for to to give the negotiating power to the buyer for uh, for those things that nobody knew. So excellent. Let's jump to another question Um, from that cold northern state that I'm from. It's my understanding that when you sell a home, certain deficiencies have to be repaired. So down here in Florida, let's say, for example, an inspector goes through and in the kitchen that was remodeled some years ago, they don't have the, the GFI um, circuits, the, you know, the, I call them the local circuit breakers on the wall switch. It met the code when the kitchen was done, but it doesn't need meet today's code. How, how should or how is that handled? What's the obligation on either side when that's, Um, brought up in an inspection report. Sure. So this is a a common issue. Many buyers think that properties have to be up to the current building code. And that's just not at all true. If it were, every time the building code changed, many, many homes would become unsaleable. And there would be a massive amount of remodeling to make all of those homes saleable again. So it just wouldn't be a working model to have the seller repair everything and bring everything up to code. So the standard in the contract for the repair limit contract is that everything needs to be in working condition. And that means that it's working in the manner that it was designed to operate. Um, And the contract contrasts that with cosmetic conditions, which are aesthetic and professions that don't affect the working condition. Um, Under Again, the as-is contract, the, uh, you'd have an unqualified right to terminate and, you, again, just get out of all of those disputes and issues. So to me, it really comes down to, and one of the basic business principles I feel very strong about, it creates a win-win if the contract goes forward because you have a better idea of what you're buying and the seller has a better idea of what they're selling. So at the end of the day, there shouldn't be any surprises after closing. And, and and I'll just do a little commercial here. I love tough inspectors because I'd rather deal with any headaches and any problems that, that may exist that we can't see with the eye before closing. Because after closing, there's limited recourse, at least in, in my mind. If, if someone tries to raise an issue, Mike, on a, a structural issue after closing that wasn't identified through the process or anything, there's really not a whole lot if the seller didn't know, is there? So you're in a tough spot at that point. After closing, you would have to prove that the seller knew about it, that it materially affected the value, and that it was not readily observable. And it's hard to prove that a seller had actual knowledge of a defect. 
because anything that's readily observable, they don't have to disclose. So you have to prove in a non-disclosure suit that the seller had knowledge of a defect which was not readily observable. So that's difficult to prove somebody knew something they couldn't see. Uh, and typically, uh, the areas where it really becomes collectible or there's a good cause of action is where a seller's done kind of a haphazard repair to an item and then failed to disclose it. But in the vast majority of cases, there's just no evidence that the seller had actual knowledge of whatever the defect is. So the key is, is to identify everything up front and handle it through the negotiations. Um, and, and you keep going back to the two contracts, the as is and the repair limit. The as is actually allows the negotiations to continue where both sides can create a win-win environment if they elect to. You know, one side or the other could be really tough and, and difficult and can, could tank the deal and, and that happens and so be it. But this framework, um, you know, even it's called as is, the framework is to create an environment where we could talk and where we can bring the buyers and sellers together because if that win-win doesn't occur, that deal is not going to close or it's not going to close the right way. Um, that's the contract that we favor here at Tim Rennick. Uh, I, I think it just gives everyone a, a, a whole more opportunity. And, and, and I'll give you my opinion on the repair limit. So for folks that haven't seen that, up front when we write an offer, before we have an inspection, we ask the seller to commit a certain amount of dollars to fix things that we don't know that are wrong. So I'm just a little confused on, on why that's a, a good approach because what happened is the seller will come back and say, gee, you know, we, we don't know anything. I'm, I'm not comfortable with that figure. So I'll change that to, from one and a half percent to zero. The buyer gets the counter back and sees a zero and says, well, gee, the seller doesn't want to work with me, which may not even be the case. So what we have, and I've experienced this, is we have an upset buyer and seller before we've gotten anything off the ground. And that's not a, a win, win scenario. That's not, in, in my mind, conducive to a, a, a good business relationship that we need to get this across the finish line. Is that a good way to look at it, Mike? It, it is. And also, the process from the, the repair limit contract is very convoluted, and it's not intuitive. What people think the contract requires is what they would do in their normal business relationships. They would have an inspection and they would say, hey, seller, here are the things I found. We fix them. And then they would expect the seller to say yes or no. In this contract, that's not exactly what's required. The seller's obligated to get estimates on all of the things the buyer identifies. And that that difference makes people deviate from the contract. And often by the time the inspection issues get to me, they're so far off what the contact or what the contract contemplated that it's difficult to give clients any certainty. Um, and I know I've harped on it over and over and over again, but the as is contract just gets rid of all that uncertainty. You either canceled or negotiated in your 15 days or you didn't. So if I was representing a buyer and I wanted to use a repair limit contract and we submitted it and the, re and the inspection came out um, below the dollars and the seller fixed it, even if the buyer didn't like the way it was fixed, I've pretty much got that buyer locked in at that point, don't I? Correct, right. And that's absolutely what Team Rennick stands against. We're not interested in locking somebody in to something that's not right for them. The other contract allows the negotiations where if buyers and sellers don't have a meeting of the minds of what's going to get fixed, how it's going to get fixed, and the quality of the fix, then they can part, um, not probably as friends, but they're going to part company and the deal won't happen. And to me, a broker that cares about their buyer, that's the only contract that should be used, and that's the only one we use here at Team Rennick. Sorry for the commercial but we're really not interested in locking somebody in and saying, hey, I got you. You got to go to the finish line. We're interested in what's doing right for the client. And I just don't see how the other contract can be right. It's always the as-is contract. Does that make any sense, Mike? It absolutely does. And it gets almost absurd when you apply it to things that most people have more experience with. So let's say I was going to sell you a car. But Mike, you and I have to agree upon the car 
before I let you take a look at it. But I will tell you I'll repair a certain amount of stuff in the car after you've looked at it. You'd look at me and you'd say, no, you're crazy. I want to go look at the car, make sure it's okay. And if it's okay, I'll buy it from you. And that, in a nutshell, is the difference between the two contracts and the way the inspections work. No, I, I love that analogy. I hadn't looked at it that way. So let me put you on the spot. Is an inspection process a critical process in the buy and sale um, of real estate? Absolutely. I mean, to buy something for hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars and not to spend the time doing the investigations and the expenses, just asking for problems later. And I think is by far the most important thing a buyer can do in the process. So you would advise your clients, at least the buyers, that that's money well spent at that point? Absolutely, yes. And as a real estate agent, one of the things I feel strong about is that, uh, you know, because clients are always asking for recommendations for inspectors. And, and of course, we can't pick one over the other, but they'll ultimately ask which ones we've seen work the most. And the ones we've seen work the most are the ones that are the most tenacious out there. And again, it's all about finding things ahead of time so we can have that discussion open and freely at the negotiation table. So it just, to me, makes a lot of sense. So the inspection process is a critical process. It's one that everybody wants to think carefully before you decide to walk away and not do that, even for condos. A lot of times in a condo inspection process, we find things that the associations require to fix. And that's a good thing because when that new buyer takes ownership, they're walking into a condo that's much more trouble free than if there were still significant things that, um, like that that were, were broken. Absolutely. We had a, an issue just last week where we got to tell a condo association about the termites that they didn't know they had. Um, so those inspections do provide some common good as well in condos. Okay. Mike, anything else to add? This has been fantastic. You have the great ability to take a complex topic and make it easily understandable in very simple terms. That's a huge skill to have. So, so thank you. Anything else to add? Uh, no, just uh, thank you for having me and uh, keep up the good work out there. No, I appreciate it, Mike. Thanks a lot. We'll be back together sometime down the road with another topic. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Talk soon. Take care.